thank you for this kind uh, invitation. Um, unfortunately, Risto was, uh, was uh, well, he's a very busy man. So um, I'm here today instead of Risto to tell you about this wonderful technique, which I think is very exciting. And uh, um, I'm, because this is a student uh, conference, I, I have kind of synthesized uh, a set of research not only my own research, but kind of, I think the fundamental findings that I find really aspiring, which have utilized this work and uh, and hopefully uh, hopefully get you interested. Um, personally, I'm a, I'm a postdoc currently in Aalto University, Finland, working still uh, in close collaboration with Risto Ilmoniemi, who was my PhD uh, supervisor, but I also have my own, own funding and own um, research projects. Um, but yeah, now without further ado, let's get started. So this is basically the uh, content of today's talk. So first, I want to explain you the um, the fundamentals of um, of uh, the uh, method, and um, and uh, that will be really important to kind of follow the later part of the talk. But I encourage you to listen carefully because then I do think that we will get into very exciting stuff about uh, brain functioning. We get some revelations about the, maybe the um, the the mystery of consciousness, for instance, and what TMSEG can show us about that and this type of stuff. So please listen to the first part of the talk as well. Um, then the TMSEG, it's it's not just fun and games; it's also technically a highly challenging method. So I'm I'm going to address in the later part of the talk if we have time some of the current challenges that we are struggling with the with the uh, method and maybe the potential ways forward where the uh, field is going in the future from the technical and uh, neuroscientific point of view okay but what is the, what is cms what's the idea of transcranial magnetic stimulation well the idea is uh, fundamentally what we want to do is that we want to activate the brain somewhere in the in the point that we are interested in without actually invasive uh, surgery or opening the skull. So we want to have a healthy patient or subject coming in and we want to activate the brain without doing causing any harm to the subject. And uh, uh, how you can do that in a very sneaky way is through transcranial magnetic stimulation. And the idea is uh, here to use like these fundamental electromagnetics that I'm sure that you are familiar with and we utilize the fact that whenever there is a time varying changing magnetic field, that actually induces an electric field. So what we do is that we bring a coil very close to our subject's head or right next to the subject's head. We drive a very strong time varying electric pulse through that coil. And from the electromagnetics, this generates a time varying magnetic field in the room and also in the head of the subject. And it is actually this, uh, time varying magnetic field inside the brain that induces a electric field in the brain that is then activating the neurons. Uh, so here you can see some models, modeling work showing what kind of electric fields you would cause from these type of coils in the cortex. I have a second uh, image here. So we cause this type of strong tangential electric field on the cortical surface without opening the skull or scalp or anything. Um, and this electric field is originally, it is quite focal. So this is also very important for understanding the results that we are going to look at later on, the research results, to understand that we are actually activating a, a relatively focal area of the cortex. And this is a very important feature of TMS because that will allow us then to interpret the uh, a certain brain, brain signals from the brain connectivity point of view. Uh, so this electric field, as I said, it's now affecting the cortex, especially the most superficial parts of the cortex. And we can also model different types of uh, neuron populations on the cortex and ask, ask questions like what would be the most probable neurons that would be activated. And uh, it could be, for instance, it seems quite likely from this type of neuron level modeling work that it could be the uh, layer two to three pyramidal cells uh, that are kind of superficial and maybe more on the chiral lip uh, almost oriented tangentially because in that orientation the electric field is is very effective so when this electric field that can be 
roughly of the order of 100 uh, volts per meter hits these certain neurons at the superficial layers, it is strong enough to actually depolarize them enough to cause these uh, neurons to fire action potentials. So action potentials are the signals that neurons are sending to one another to communicate and all of our thoughts and brain processes are of course uh, constructed upon these neurophysiological signals. So these neurons actually send physiological signals to one another due to this very brief and strong magnetic pulse. Uh, now, without, without opening the skull, um, we cannot actually record these action potentials directly because they are quite weak and they don't cause uh, strong uh, signals at the scalp or if we would have a magnetic imaging device, uh, a MEG uh, magnetoencephalography device, we couldn't measure those magnetic fields. But what happens is that when these neurons get activated at the same time and cause action potentials. When, whenever neurons communicate with one another, there is a synaptic current and synapses between these neurons. And it is actually the synaptic currents that we can measure with, uh, with methods such as EET that you already heard about uh, in the previous talk. So EET is basically, it's a measure of voltage across the scalp. And uh, and it is quite remarkable that when there are sufficient neurons that are, are um, causing these postsynaptic currents synchronously, let's say about 10,000 or so, it actually creates a voltage that is strong enough about microvolt scale on the scalp that we can record. And, and this gives us rather direct way to measure the, re the reactions that we have caused cortically with TMS. So, just to repeat a little bit, we use our CMS transcranial magnetic stimulator to activate a cortex at a desired spot. And then when we combine the EEC with that method, we can measure the reactions. And uh, we will get just a little bit deeper into this idea still before looking at some results. So, so why would you want to do that? Why, why, why does anybody care about CMS? Um, so, of course, if we think about the brain, like all sorts of functions that the brain can have, uh, we have measured the uh, brain reactions for quite, quite a long time by now already, like at least, um, at least 50 years we have been able to measure reliably different types of responses to, for instance, uh, visual stimuli or, um, or auditory stimuli or tactile stimuli. So those are easy because we have we have direct pathways to activate those cortices. So for instance, if we want to study how brain, brain is um, processing visual stimuli, we take our subject to a chair and we give them some sort of visual stimuli, whether it's a blinking light or a checkerboard image or what have you, you the patient or subject will see the uh, visual stimuli and that will activate the brain. Now, if you have a method such as EEG, you will see eventually the visual cortex um, getting activated. You can, of course, do the same for sensory stimuli. You can have, for instance, electric stimulation of your hand, get some sensations there or some sort of uh, pressurized uh, tactile stimuli, and you will activate the somatosensory cortex. And there's a limited number of, of cortical areas that you can activate using our natural pathways that we, we have in our body. But, uh, but what if we are interested in, let's say, the some higher functional, uh, higher um, cognitive function, such as um, uh, such as uh, some sort of uh, task control or uh, decision making that could be, for instance, um, utilizing heavily our frontal lobe? How could we activate that in a kind of a neat, controlled, and precise way? And that is not uh, so easy. Of course, you can give your subjects behavioral tasks, but sometimes you might want to actually just pinpoint and just kind of activate and probe a certain region to see what happens to for a research question or maybe to treat certain uh, mental illness. And, and for those type of questions, it is very useful to have a method that you can just bring over the cortex of, of interest and start activating it without thinking a some sort of natural pathway to activate that region. So here, the purple area is an example of a um, frontal cortex that we want to activate. 
And for that, TMS can be very, very useful. Um, well, next, maybe the next obvious question is then, why would you then want to do use EEC with TMS? And again, we can actually, the, the first studies that have used TMS or the magnetic stimulation, they were focusing on motor cortex. And there is, there is not necessarily need immediately to use EEC, for instance, with motor cortex, because what you can do is that uh, you, you look for the motor cortex of your subject, you activate that primarily with the uh, magnetic stimulation. And what you have is that you can actually measure the muscle reaction. So if you have sufficient intensity, you can actually see your subject's hand moving, for instance, if you are stimulating the uh, hand representation area of the primary motor cortex, or then you can you can measure the uh, muscle responses with more accuracy electronically. And that will give you kind of direct input or, or pretty direct input of the cortical reactivity as primary motor cortex for TMS. You can also do this on a visual cortex. Uh, there are many studies where the subjects have reported seeing phosphines, so this kind of uh, flashing lights from a direct stimulation of the visual cortex with, with no actual visual stimuli through the eyes. And uh, there are a few studies where the somatosensory cortex have been activated with the magnetic stimulation, such that the stimuli has been able to block, block the sensations from this natural tactile stimulus. So, uh, so those are few examples of how you can measure kind of more directly the responses to magnetic stimulation. But quite obviously, there are still a lot of cortical areas where you cannot actually measure the responses to, to uh, TMS. And for that reason, it can be really useful to uh, combine EEG with TMS. So for instance, in the case of the frontal cortex, if we place the EEG electrodes on the scalp, uh, maybe this image is a little bit um, kind of misleading. These electrodes are never on the brain <laughs> surface, but, but on the scalp. Um, then once this uh, frontal cortex gets activated, there is sufficient post-synaptic current, and that causes actual, actual measurable potentials on the scalp, and we can measure the voltage. And this comes even more becomes even more in, interesting, in my opinion, if we actually look at the activation somewhere else. So we can stimulate the frontal cortex with TMS. And this is the fact, this is the place where it is important to remember that actually the electric field that we induce with TMS is strong, but focal. Because if we, if we focally activate frontal cortex with magnetic stimulation, but we actually measure activity somewhere else on the cortex, let's say using EEG, what we, can, what we have is a great method to studying directly connectivity and, uh, and uh, effective connectivity, meaning that there is a causal relationship. You, you stimulate in a controlled manner a different region in the cortex, and you measure with some delay in few tens of milliseconds, you measure a repeatable response in a different part of the cortex. To me, that is a, a great example of a actual causal measurement of connectivity. So if you're not that familiar with the connectivity, it basically means, or connectivity study, it basically means the study of, of connections from brain area to another. And there are many types of, of um, connectivity analysis, but um, maybe the most, most used one is to measure, measure brain activity for an extended period of time and look for correlations in time signals between remote cortical regions or brain regions. And this is taken as a evidence for connectivity. But really it is not because uh, correlation doesn't mean causality. It doesn't mean that there was necessarily a direct link. And this is what differentiates TMSEG from many other methods is that we have a very clear causal relationship. We at a time point zero, we activate a cortical point of interest and we measure with time delay with EET the responses elsewhere in the cortex to see where this one node that was probed is connected to. And, uh, 
and now we will start uh, looking at the the research that have been done with this uh, idea. Uh, actually, before that, there is just one more slide. So I just want to give you a concrete idea of how actually the uh, TMSEG currently looks like with the um, current kind of state of the art commercial devices. So uh, what we have here is is a uh, healthy subject. Uh, this is the TMS coil that we bring close to the head uh, over the uh, cortical region of interest. What what is uh, nowadays um, recommended is that you connect this with the neural navigation, meaning that the subject is wearing these uh, infrared markers and there is a infrared camera. And uh, you can see that the coil has similar markers as well. And uh, because we have taken the magnetic resonance images of the anatomy of the subject beforehand, and uh, we have calibrated the location of the markers with respect to the MRI, we actually know in real time the exact location of this TMS coil over the cortex. And here we can see that we are over the primary motor cortex, basically uh, over the uh, hand knob, more or less. And the subject is at the same time wearing this EEG cap. And this EEG cap has typically 60 to 120 electrodes. And there is some, we inject some conductive gel which connects these electrodes and the scalp. And this allows us to measure the potentials or the voltages on the scalp. And uh, yeah, that's that's more or less how the method looks like. But I wanted to give you kind of a concrete feeling of, of, the, uh, of the experiment. Okay, so uh, Florin already nicely talked about the uh, first studies by, uh, by uh, Professor Ilmeniemi using this uh, method. And, and this is now the seminal kind of iconic image of, uh, of uh, effective connectivity over the primary motor core disease. So the first study that they did on 1997 was to, was to activate the left primary motor cortex with transcranial magnetic pulses and measure the corresponding EEG responses. And what you can see here is that uh, very fast, the activity from the uh, left primary motor cortex is uh, transmitted through the transcolosal fibers to the contralateral hemisphere. So it is demonstrating, maybe not surprisingly, but it is demonstrating directly that the motor cortices must be heavily interlinked. So this is not maybe a super surprising uh, neuroscientific finding that they must be connected in order to communicate and uh, organize uh, movement patterns and so forth. But it is nicely demonstrating the, uh, the potentials of this method. And uh, I think the video is super cool and kind of uh, has become kind of iconic. Uh, here is a, a still image of the um, kind of, of the video we can see that First of all, from the uh, uh, from the primary motor cortex, as I explained, in about 24 milliseconds, there is a clear measurable response on the contralateral hemisphere. Uh, one might ask that why does it take so long? It probably the signals from the left to right doesn't take that long, but we have to remember that it is a measure of the postsynaptic currents, and uh, once the action potentials from the left primary motor cortex arrive to the right side, there is some delay before the uh, post synaptic currents start to emerge and we actually have a measurable EEG response. And uh, they also, in the original paper, they also stimulated, a, I have to confess that, um, now I don't remember for sure whether it was frontal cortex, but I do think this is a frontal cortex. So, so looking the brain from the, uh, from uh, uh, the face direction, um, but it's not very clear. But anyway, the, uh, they stimulated also another region in the cortex, showing similar transglossal connection. I do think that this is a, a cerebellum, but actually on the back of the brain, the posterior part of the brain. But again, it takes about 20, 20 to uh, 28 milliseconds to get the response on the contralateral hemisphere. Then the, the next step, then after this uh, kind of first initial finding of uh, Risto 
Ilmo Niemi, Professor Ilmo Niemi, was the very famous work by Professor Massimini. And uh, and once once Professor Massimini saw this first study by Ilmo Niemi, he got really inspired that now I have a method to actually study my research question. And Professor Massimini was very interested in in what happens at the different stages of of consciousness and uh, from collaboration with the uh, very famous neuroscientist professor uh, Giulio Tononi uh, they they had uh, this theory that uh, consciousness is about uh, integration of information so if there is a greater degree of of consciousness you are in a fully conscious state then uh, that means that your brain regions are highly connected so there is constant uh, constant uh, transmission and receiving of information from cortical area to another and this uh, kind of dialogue and interaction between remote uh, re cortical regions in a highly complex way that is kind of the fingerprint of of consciousness but but this is quite difficult to test um, but once uh, Professor Massimini saw this uh, work where you could actually stimulate a node of interest and see how the activity spreads in time, he kind of knew that now he had the tools to test this idea. And, and in this work, first study that they had, they, uh, they had healthy subjects. So they, they had the healthy subjects first awake. So being in a, in a state that we kind of could, uh, I guess, universally agree is, is a conscious state when you're healthy. And then they had the same patients, uh, sorry, subjects falling asleep. So falling a deep, uh, deeper level stages of sleep. And they repeated this TMS ET study. And in this uh, first gift that I have here, you can see kind of a video of how this initially really focal activity at this, um, um, I think this is kind of a premotor, premotor area how that spreads to very distant cortical regions over time. And this is measured from a awake subject. And again, just showing the, the same data from the video, but now as a, as a good figure from the uh, original science paper, you can see that the, uh, the initial activity is where we have, or where they stimulate it, originally but then these activities start spreading to very comp in a very complicated way to co distant cortical regions and this takes a long long time and overall you can also see from the time courses that the responses are highly complex but now if we have the same subject in a deep uh, deep sleep we can see that actually this these time courses are completely different, so the responses are much, much bigger, but they are also much, much simple in their structure. So there is just a couple of big deflections and then it already dies out. And if we localize from the ET patterns, the, the uh, cortical activity, we can see that it actually stays put. So it stays there where they had stimulated. So they don't actually observe this global high level of connectivity that they theoreticized to be to be very important for uh, consciousness so so they interpreted this as direct evidence for their theory of consciousness and of course i mean scientifically it's of course super important or scientifically it's a very kind of a fundamental question that what is our consciousness made of i think but it can also have like a very um practical clinical value for instance because it is very difficult to uh, it's very difficult to quantify consciousness but but if consciousness is indeed a question about the degree of global connectivity maybe you could use this as a way to diagnose for instance patients who are suffering from uh, different degrees of loss of consciousness so they could be subjects who have had a traumatic brain injury or a very severe stroke or, and have gone into a coma-like uh, state. And it is very difficult to, you know, for instance, to, for making educated decisions for these patients, it's very difficult to evaluate whether they are 
with, whether they are semi-conscious, uh, at what level of consciousness are they? Are they in a completely vegetative state? And and this has been one of the primary interests of of uh, Massim in his group. Then uh, after this uh, initial work um, during sleep, and in this study by Rosanova and others, they saw that that if you have patients at different stages or degrees of loss of consciousness, you actually have di different degrees of uh, global connectivity. So in the beginning, you have vegetative state, um, vegetative state patients, and you can see a very similar pattern as what we observed in a healthy patient that was in deep sleep. Then if you have patients who are minimally conscious, in a minimally conscious state, you can see that the activity starts to become more complicated and and in the uh, the healthiest uh, healthiest subjects or patients we get the, the highest degree of of complexity so this is showing converging evidence that this could indeed be true this uh, theory of consciousness and tms eg could be a very good way to probe that um I will show you one more study about studying connectivity. Um, but uh, for showing that work, I have to introduce a concept first. And uh, that will allow us to look into kind of the most, I think one of the most elaborate ways so far to look at the uh, cortical connectivity with tms -EG. But yeah, before that, let's introduce this concept. So, uh, so another, um, another place where tms -ET has been utilized has been to study the so-called um, so-called natural or resonance frequencies of cortical networks. And uh, what what does this mean? Well, the idea is that uh, there there is a quite a lot of uh, animal research and theoretical work suggesting that. Uh, when we have cortical cortical connectivity, so connections from cortical node to another, actually this signal might be traveling through the uh, through the deep brain structures, like uh, like uh, thalamus or uh, the pontine nucleus or a combination of these deep structures, and even even um, kind of cortical activity in a in a one location might actually reflect these um, transmitted and received signals from this corticothalamic circuit. So on the left, we can see a one, one area of cortex that would be connected to the thalamus. And there would be constant uh, connections from the different cortical layers to the thalamus, and then kind of a relayed feedback signal to the same cortical region. And in ET, uh, over the past, I don't know, maybe at least 20 years, probably more, there has been excessive study of the so-called cortical oscillations. So whenever you look at the EEG signal, it doesn't have to be TMS EEG, but it can be just resting state EEG. You can observe these, these kind of emerging oscillations at different frequencies, for instance, at 10 Hertz or 15 Hertz or so. And people have done a lot of studies and research on what what the, what is the function of these oscillations? Could they carry information, and in how in what way would they modulate the cortical and brain activity? And and this theory would would suggest that at least partially these oscillations would be reflecting these uh, these um, reflected signals, the cortical signals that would be reflected from the thalamus back to the cortical cortical surface. And there could be kind of uh, oscillations from a cortical region to a thalamus and back, but there could also be connections from a cortical region to another, and there could be even multiple frequencies that would be mixed. And, and we would want to probe that what would be those natural frequencies at which these signals are sent from the cortex to thalamus and back. So in a way, you could think a very simple analog. So you could think a a swing, a child on a swing, and at first uh, the swing is a at rest. But if you push the swing, then the swing starts to well swing, and 
And the exact frequency at which this swing uh, oscillates depends actually the, on the properties of the swing. It depends on the friction of the swing. It depends on the uh, on the uh, length of those chains. Uh, but you can you can probe this by giving this very short lasting push to the swing and then it starts to swing. Then you could have a video camera, for instance, recording the swing and look at the frequencies. And in a way, the uh, using TMSEC to look at these cortical natural frequencies a, is analog to this. So we have a push, which in this case is a very short lasting TMS pulse. So we put a lot of energy to the neurons at the cortical surface with this TMS pulse. And then we measure the EET response for a extended period of time to see how these, uh, what kind of oscillations and frequencies we evoke by doing this. And uh, this was studied by, uh, by again, Rosanova, actually, I know this, <laughs> by Rosanova and others in 2009, where they stimulated different cortical regions with single TMS pulses and, and recorded the, uh, the uh, evoked oscillations, not only these kind of time curves. And what is very interesting is that, um, for instance, when you stimulate the occipital cortex with this very brief instantaneous pulse, you actually evoke mostly low frequencies around alpha. And it is well, very well known from the basic EEG literature that, that occipital oscillations tend to be highest at the at the alpha frequency around 10 hertz. So even with this brief pulse, you were you were able to cause this kind of natural oscillations. And this this could indeed uh, reflect the fact that we are causing the occipital cortex to resonate. Uh, also, interestingly, the more you moved with your TMS coil towards the uh, frontal region, the higher was the caused or the evoked uh, frequency. This is also consistent with the, with a lot of monkey work and and so forth, where kind of the uh, it's not as as simple as this, of course. But the rule of thumb is that the the higher the cognitive function, the uh, the more frontal you go, and the the higher frequencies might be in, involved in those higher cognitive functions. Also, interestingly, um, uh, at least at least to an extent. If you stimulated a remote region, let's say this uh, premotor area with the mark with blue, and you measured the uh, responses at at a remote cortical region, for instance, occipital cortex, you actually didn't observe the frequency um, at the stimulated natural frequency of, of 29 hertz. You actually observed a weak response at the natural frequency of that cortex of of readout, so the occipital cortex. And if we go a few slides back and look at this model, this would make sense if, if these uh, frequencies would be reflecting the uh, corticothalamic uh, resonance frequencies. So there might you might be stimulating a prefrontal cortex, for instance, and if there is a connect, uh, connection to the parietal cortex, what happens is that you will observe frequencies at the prefrontal cortex thalamic natural frequency and at the parietal cortex you are seeing activity but mainly at the parietal to thalamic uh, to thalamus uh, natural frequencies so this is quite exciting and interesting and now we get into the last example of of sudden connectivity with tms EC. and and many of these works have been quite old already um, but this is very recent so this is from from last year by uh, veniero and others and uh, and what they studied here was the role of uh, of the frontal eye fields so frontal eye fields is this cortical regions that is that well it, it is a little bit debated on what it is what is its exact role but one one theory is that it has although it is close to the motor cortices that it has this type of a top-down control role in, in visual attention. And uh, this is a very nice example of, of a study where they combined TMS and EEG, but also to behavioral results demonstrating 
on multiple levels the connections between the frontal eye fields and this uh, occipital cortex that we know for sure to be connected with visual attention and visual tasks. So, so in short, what they did was that they stimulated with the, with the single pulses the uh, frontal eye fields on the right hemisphere. And, but then they used EEG to measure the responses at the, uh, at the occipital cortex. And uh, in this case, uh, they actually observed the strongest uh, activity at the beta frequency around 15 hertz. And uh, this is, as you can see, this is a little bit um, in, um, uh, th this is a little bit contradictive to the previous results, but that's how neuroscience is. But anyway, that was their finding that this uh, focal stimulated frontal eye fields caused this uh, beta frequency at the occipital cortex. So this, in a way, this is already kind of a, a evidence for, or not kind of, but it is a, a partial evidence for connectivity, because we know that we are activating the frontal eye fields focally, and the electric field from this stimulation location is not sufficient to activate the occipital cortex. However, we are still able to measure a, a clear response with good signal-to-noise ratio from a very remote region. Uh, but this becomes even more exciting uh, when they when they uh, introduced a a uh, second stimulus. So what they did was that they stimulated both the frontal eye fields and the occipital cortex with TMS with paired pulses. And the idea was that uh, they were measuring these phosphines that I briefly mentioned. So phosphine is a evoked sensation of of um, of a visual light flash that you cause with TMS from occipital cortex. And they varied the uh, stimulus intervals between these pulses. And you could actually observe that with this beta frequencies around 16 hertz, the actual excitability or the, the probability for these phosphines varied. So it means that it, it oscillated at the same frequency, the, um, the likelihood for causing phosphine. So when there was a one pulse, a conditioning stimulus to the frontal eye fields and then a test stimulus to the occipital cortex, depending on the exact time interval between these pulses, there, were, there was different uh, likelihood for observing a phosphine. And it oscillated at the exact same frequency at what they observed from a single pulse to the frontal eye fields, demonstrating that there is, there is uh, probably top-down control from the uh, frontal eye fields to the occipital cortex, and this control would be transmitted through the uh, through the beta frequency. That's what this data suggests. I think this is a very exciting way to uh, look at the um, uh, the uh, cortical cortical connectivity with the MSEG. I I want to mention some other ways to also use TMSET, not only look at the connectivity, and probably one of the most classic ways is to look at just the excitability. So with the excitability, we basically mean that we uh, we stimulate the cortex, and with EEG, we measure how big responses we get. And this alone is not very interesting, but if you have the subjects, and you put those subjects into different conditions, and and you observe how this re reactivity, meaning the size of responses changes due to these conditions, this can become a very interesting way to um, probe the brain. So for instance, in this example work by Reto Hooper and others, what they did was to, they imposed their patients or subjects to uh, sleep deprivation. So first of all, they the subjects came well, well rested to the first experiment, and they measured the TMSEG responses from, um, I think it must have been from the primary motor cortex, but I'm, I'm not sure that's not essential here. Basically, they measured the cortical responses from these subjects who were well rested. Then they forced the subjects to stay awake for a prolonged period of time to become really tired 
and <laughs> kind of act agitated. And what they observed was that after sleep deprivation, the responses, the initial responses and reactivity got much, much bigger. So actually this sleep deprivation somehow seemed to uh, decrease the uh, decrease the uh, level of inhibition in the cortex and kind of the controlled nature of the cortical responses. And again, if you wouldn't combine this with some behavioral data, this alone would be maybe a hint of evidence. But what they did very nicely was that they put the subjects into this kind of a test, this uh, game where this white dot was trying to move away from the center all the time in this erratic manner. And the task was to keep it at, at the center with the joystick. And when the subjects were like fully rested, they were really good at this task. So they were able to really have like a fine motor control. But when they were sleep deprived, they made much too big movements. And actually the, the movement of the dot became much more erratic. So this was in kind of a perfectly aligned with the cortical responses, stating that there is kind of over excitatory nature of cortex due to sleep deprivation. And that that maybe makes you perform worse when you haven't slept well enough. Another funny example is the uh, is this uh, work by Kähkönen, where they basically they had patients or subjects coming to the test first completely sober, and then they gave them uh, enough alcohol, and they measured the changes in the TMSET responses. And what they observed was a massive decrease in this N100 response. So when when they when the subjects became drunk, there was this massive decrease in N100 response. And what maybe makes this funny is that the N100 from from some other studies, there is strong evidence that the N100 um, is reflecting the kappaotic inhibitive um, inhibitive processes in the cortex. And uh, I think we, all of us might have like some uh, real life experience that people under the influence of alcohol have less inhibition on, and are behaving kind of in an uncontrolled way. So this was again in line with our behavioral experience. Okay, I think I have only about two minutes before the questions and answers. Go no, take your time, you have time. Uh, okay. So then after these uh, kind of, um, uh, I think these uh, interesting studies, I want to go into a little bit more boring stuff and and emphasize the fact that unfortunately, TMSET is not just a magic way to measure nice responses from the uh, cortex and nice direct readouts from the connectivity. It It actually is technically a really, really difficult method. And unfortunately, like recent years, we have noticed uh, many confounding signals that that make the interpretation of the TMS-ET signals difficult. And uh, maybe one of the most serious ones was this finding by Conde et al. a few years ago, where they compared the genuine TMS-evoked ET responses to these sham stimulus, where they, they had this kind of a fake coil um, with some, um, or I guess this coil is actually real, but it was it is far, far enough from the cortex that the magnetic field actually cannot activate the cortex. However, this coil makes a genuine sound. So whenever you give TMS pulses, the coil makes this very strong clicking sounds due to the strengths on the uh, copper wires. And in addition to that, quite often you do have a very clear sensations on your scalp. It, it's not painful, it's not uncomfortable to be a subject, um, but um, you can clearly feel when you're being stimulated because this uh, electric field can also activate the nerves on your scalp or maybe sometimes your muscles. So with this uh, coil that caused the click, they also combined this electric direct activation of the scalp. And this now made kind of a more realistic SAM condition that they compared to the uh, TMS-ET responses. And and the unfortunate unfortunate uh, outcome was that the the, uh, the responses looked highly similar between the genuine TMS evoked responses and then these sham sham stimuli uh, stimuli evoked uh, responses. So at least this 
this showed clearly that we have to be really careful with the when analyzing the data and interpreting it. Uh, luckily, there are some ways to uh, to uh, or pre pre measures to um, to try to minimize these confounds so we can have masking noise to the subjects to try to cover the click and we can always stimulate locations at the cortex that where you feel the electric feed less so in general the less the muscles are activated from the lateral sides of the head the less you can feel the simulation so i i still think that some of the fundamental findings from for instance by massimini et al we can trust them because for their research questions they have simulated areas where it is more difficult to actually actually sense the stimulus directly and they use noise masking but it does make you more cautious and understand the limits of the um, of the method another big problem is the uh, um, is the muscle artifact so in the beginning i promoted the uh, tms as a great method or tms ec kind of as a great method to activate any part of the cortex and then measure the response is anywhere in the in the cortex with EEG, but unfortunately, it's not quite as as straightforward because, as I said, especially from the lateral aspects, you tend to get really strong activation of your of your muscles, and those can easily corrupt the uh, EEG signals. Uh, I forgot to put the citation here. Um, that's probably good because this is this is from my paper, so it's not so so serious. But uh, this is Mutan and 2000. 13, I think, um, where, where we map these uh, muscle responses. And you can clearly see that these regions, which are typically activated actually by Massimini group, because for them, it's not so important what they activate. They just want to measure the global connectivity. You can actually measure very clean signals, but whenever you start to move to more lateral sites, and especially if you will activate, for instance, the, you would want to study language areas such as Broca's area, you are going to get into troubles. So one, one solution that I do suggest, and we need to develop this further, is to combine modeling work. So we, we try to utilize all, everything we know about the electromagnetics and the electrophysiology of the cortex to model the genuine transcranial responses to TMS. And we can use this to create algorithms that are then able to differentiate between extracranial responses from intracranial responses. So at least this can help to uh, noise signals just as muscle artifacts, which are coming from the uh, extracranial sources. But the difficulty is that when you have auditory responses to the clicking coil or somatosensory sensations, they actually create cortical responses that are very similar to the actual transcranial responses. So for those, it, it will be, it is difficult to differentiate them. And it doesn't necessarily mean that all of the findings, or most likely it doesn't mean that all of the findings that I've showed you so far are false, but, but it, does, it does change the interpretation of those results maybe slightly. If, if we take into account that part of those ET signals might be coming from actual, actual uh, sensory pathways, rather than the transcranial activity. Of course, like findings such as alcohol affecting the N100 can be just as kind of um, just as informative almost, but, but it, you need to take this into account. Um, also, I, I spent quite a great deal about looking into connectivity, but the results that I showed were either individual like representative subjects or than average results. But uh, overall, if you if you take different individuals and you stimulate them to a cortical region that you thought was was the same, you actually might get highly variable pa patterns of connectivity. So so the intersubject uh, variability is one big challenge in the in the field. And uh, you know, big variability, if you're looking at populational responses, for instance, it can uh, diminish your effect sizes. So what kind of ways do we maybe suggest or, or envision in the future to tackle, for instance, this um, intersubject variability? A big project that we have 
now in Aalto University and also in uh, collaboration with the Tübingen University, um, the group of uh, Professor Zeman, and then the University of Chieti, the group of uh, Gianluca Romani, is to construct this uh, next generation ET guided uh, TMS ET device. So the idea is that we would be in real time recording ET activity and we would be estimating the brain brain states from the ongoing ET and we would only target the brain at those time points when the brain state would be as favorable favorable to our responses as possible or we also can move the stimulus to optimal directions so this would not be only important for neuroscience but in the future it could uh, it would hopefully help us also to develop more effective treatment uh, protocols and you can see here this uh, kind of artistic image it wouldn't be any more one coil it would be basically this helmet of uh, team's helmet consisting of several several coils and channels and you could electronically move the stimulation location very fast and uh, our group has already constructed several prototypes that, that do work well. And this demonstrates the idea that there is, uh, we have nowadays this five coil system already, where we have five individual CMS coils. Each of them produce slightly different electric field pattern. But if we run different combinations of current pulses through these coils, we can actually electronically move the center of the kind of the main activity very fast over the cortex and if you think about this image that i showed earlier where you actually had to to move this coil you actually have to grab it with your hands move it a couple of centimeters yourself you can kind of imagine how much more uh, clumsy that is and how much slower that is compared to this electric control then the uh, the idea is then to combine this with the ET guided uh, TMS. So there are already several studies, especially by the Siemens group and people like uh, Professor Schrenner, who have studied how the cortical um, excitability, for instance, depends on the ongoing oscillations of the cortex. So we can use ET to measure these oscillations at, let's say, primary motor cortex and stimulate at different phases. And we do observe difference in the responsiveness, although I have to admit that at this, at this point in time, it is still, the effect sizes are not huge. So, so we do observe significant differences, but we haven't yet found such uh, stable ways or robust ways to measure the brain states that we would have big effect sizes due to different timings in the brain state. So here I want to kind of end the, the main talk by showing this uh, image from our research group. Um, so I'm here, I want to emphasize that I'm just a colleague, <laughs> not the, the professor, but there are some really great people here uh, with whom I have had the pleasure to collaborate. Pantelis Liomis is uh, kind of a legendary TMSET uh, researcher. We have some great students here. And uh, Victor, you can see only Victor shows us back here, but he has been one of the very important people in constructing this multi-coil device that you can see over here, which has now these five channels and this robotic arm that we use to move this uh, five coil system around the head because we don't yet have the full helmet, which is the kind of the vision in the future. And very last two slides. Um, I think you are probably most of you are master students, I think, but if if there are students who are becoming soon as a, a doctor student, doctoral students or are planning to start doctoral studies, please consider this uh, workshop, this uh, TMSET summer school that we organize annually. The next summer school will be next May and we are we will soon open the application. So please follow this web page and you can send email to me also, or ask questions in the Q&A. Uh, I, I can strongly recommend this week because there are we gather together for a week. There are some great experts of the field and you really get connected with the researchers. I think it's a, you learn a lot, but it's also like a great much fun and 
we have got quite a lot of uh, positive feedback every year how it's organized and uh, how good connections you get so this is just the group group image of of the last um, participants of of this year's science factory all right so this is my talk maybe if we have any time we I, we can look at the q and a yes we have time for the q and a i can see there it's professor ilmon in here also i think yeah I'm not seeing very well uh we oh, have here yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> this yeah. is yeah, this is Professor Ilmoniemi and uh, Ul Zeeman is here and Hartwig yeah. Siebner and Mario, actually Mario Rosanova is here. So so you can see that many of the great studies, yeah, the researchers can, you can see them in real person here if you come. Oh, it, will be, it will be an experience to be there with you. <laughs> yeah, uh, we have, um, uh, we have two questions, I think. Uh, one is more appropriate for the second part, but the second part where the panel will be in the next uh after the break but i will i will ask you uh what are the risks and benefits in using tms to treat schizophrenia i will let you answer that although yeah oh mm. <laughs> so, so i think I, I don't know if there are like really uh, now i have to admit that i don't know if there are like severe adverse effects reported i think the main risk might be that we don't that it's not going to be effective for all all patients um i know that this is one one field of study where where tms has been tested for treatment but as far as i've understood the uh, the results have been quite variable so some results have been more optimistic and and then some results have shown that it's it can be highly variable across the patients and then kind of almost null effects. So at least as far as I don't know, uh, as far as I know, I, I, I haven't heard about like serious adverse effects of of TMS, but I have to also at the same time admit that this is not my my expertise because I am not a clinician, I'm a, I'm a physicist and a medical engineer. Yeah, I, I do believe that for this question, you should ask uh, Bogdan Pano in the next uh, in the panel uh, discussion discussion panel that will be after the break with uh, Thomas and uh, uh, Bogdan Pano, who is a neurologist who has a lot of experience in clinical cases. And yeah, we will connect with uh, Thomas to discuss a little bit uh, the yeah, right. issue of TMS. Uh, there is another question. Um, how can we be sure that the waves making the connection between the prefrontal and occipital visual areas are beta waves and not gamma waves, which are spread in all in, in all the brain? So, um, so that's a good question. Um, so first of all, the, the challenge with gamma is that ET is not so sensitive to gamma activity uh, because the, uh, well, the, the gamma activity, there are a couple of reasons. It might be that the, the gamma activity, they are faster in time in a way, like the, uh, the oscillations are fast. So it is less likely that they, that they actually average in time. So they might be like gamma oscillators active in the cortex, but they don't sum so well to, to create a a very strong signal in the EEG. And also it is it is thought that to an extent these frequencies do reflect the, the level kind of that the higher frequencies might be reflecting higher um, like finer structures and the finer the structures and smaller the details the less you get EEG signals in a way because for EEG you do need to get like big enough mass response. So that's one weakness for sure that we don't get such a strong gamma activity with EEG. Um, however, I think this, uh, if I go back, so if we look at first, this, first of all here, um, it is true that maybe there is some gamma activity as well. Um, so at least we do get a strong measurable response at the remote area from, from beta frequency. Um, this, however, the, 
this could be partially due to what I just explained that the gamma simply is not so prominent in EEG. So this alone doesn't tell immediately that there is no gamma involvement. Um, however, I think this this result where the uh, the likelihood for the observation of of a phosphine from a second TMS stimulus at occipital cortex follows this beta oscillation. I think this is this shows you evidence that there is beta involvement. This, of course, doesn't mean that there wouldn't be also gamma involvement. Uh, in fact, we don't observe, for instance, like you know, you can fit a significantly fitted, you know, you can get a significant fit with a beta frequency oscillation and the measured data, but it's not perfect and there is some noise. And of course, part of the noise could be the effects that we are not modeling, for instance, the some sort of gamma frequency that they could be like a cross cross frequency coupling. So I think this evidence alone doesn't say that there is no involvement of gamma activity. For instance, a lot of monkey work shows that gamma oscillations are really important in in visual um, visual attention and visual observation. Um, but I think the this more demonstrates the involvement of beta and doesn't doesn't say too strongly about the involvement of gamma, whether it is there or whether it is not. So that's a quite long answer, but I I think that's my take on this question. And another question which I desire uh, an answer. At the summer school, we could learn how to use two equipments, EEG and T TMS. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. So so great. Uh, th thanks. Um, great question. So so the summer school uh, typically it's it has been organized in such a way that it starts with hands-on sessions for the students. So the students come one or two days before the uh, main teachers come. And uh, during the first days, there will be hands-on sessions with where you actually see the equipment and uh, and you you are thought to use it. Um, and then uh, then we this year we are probably going to have a second day where we are going to look at the data analysis, some of the basics how to take the data from the machine and how to clean it from artifacts and noise and how to get started with data analysis. And then starts the actual, or not actual, but starts the second part of the summer school where these uh, teachers from all over the world come to teach and give their lectures and and kind of more, maybe more scientific um, content to the course. But also during the week we, we have, uh, or we, we will, we will try to organize it so that there will be also possibility to have hands-on sessions during the week as well. So you can learn from uh, from the Massimini group, for instance, how they use the TMCC device and they will show it in, in practice. So that's a great question. Yeah, we, we do try to add that to the program as much as possible. Typically the program is very dense. So it's a balance of not getting people completely exhausted and also providing them as much information and content as possible. Okay, um, so now we will have a break, uh, but Thomas will get back to us uh, in the panel discussion, but the break uh, will be until uh, 1435. Uh, so let's get uh, a lunch, but uh, before leaving, just uh, remember that Neguin Rezai from Harvard Medical School will be here. Uh, talking about the syntax lexicon trade-off in language production, which is a very great talk. And Alan Umfres is going to be here also, um, talking about uh, systemic administration of brain permeable uh, CDK5 inhibitor. Uh, and we will have uh, Thomas again talking about what TMS is promising and how it delivers. Uh, uh, also, Bogdan Pana, which is a uh, known neurologist from Romania will be here. And um, we will have Ken Berridge, the great grand Ken Berridge will be with us at uh, 6 p.m. So we will wait for you in the next, uh, uh, in the second part of our um, conference. So yeah, break now, see you at uh, 14.35. Bye. Great. So see you. See you.